Fair warning, the history of the body requires a relative level of explicitness. So so you may want to listen to this one um, where little or prudish ears cannot hear you. In other words, this episode is not safe for work. Welcome to Dig, a history podcast. Sexual impotence has been a problem since the beginnings of recorded history, and since then, people have been striving to cure it. However, the cultural meanings of impotence, which is why it matters, and even its definitions, vary wildly over time and space. In ancient India, couples dealing with impotence traveled to the temple of the goddess Bahukara. Bahukara is best known as the goddess of chastity and fertility, or Shakti, which is power. She was believed to give men their vira, or semen. Even today, couples conduct pilgrimages to her temple looking for help with erectile dysfunction. The Kama Sutra recommends several medicinal concoctions to remedy impotence, to enlarge the penis, and to strengthen an erection. When those remedies fail, the Kama Sutra instructs its readers to build a device to be used in lieu of the penis. Yes, this is an instruction manual on how to build a dildo. Nice. Right? So in what uh, some historians call the Western world, and I go on a rant about this later, Mm -hmm. um, this solution wouldn't fly. Right? So the Kama Sutra's suggestion to use a dildo to give a partner pleasure when the male member is indisposed focuses on female pleasure. Right? Yeah. (laughs) To some of our listeners, this solution for impotence may seem like it misses the entire point. This is because many of our understandings about sexuality are remnants of those developed in resolutely patriarchal societies subject to Greco-Roman traditions and Abrahamic religions, early modern Europe, North Africa, and the Middle East. For much of recorded history, these patriarchal societies have understood sex as a penetrative act. For them, sexual penetration was, and still is, an imperative. This understanding of sexuality does a few things. One, it makes female pleasure less relevant to the completion of the act. And two, it links male sexual performance to his worth as a measure of his masculinity. Childbearing, in addition to the pleasure of one's partner, gave urgency to the problem of impotence in ancient India. However, for many of us, the cultural meaning of impotence has been shaped, yes, by childbirth, but also by men's emasculating failures to penetrate women with their erections. The problem was, and still is, accompanied by a host of preconceptions and value judgments. In Sarah Hanley Cousins' new book, Bodies in Blue, like she... Sarah Hanley Cousins. Sarah as Hanley Cousins. As they don't you're know who I am. Not standing directly next to me. Um, in her book, Bodies in Blue, she recounts the stories of Civil War veterans with urogenital injuries. She describes the non-visible disabilities they experienced, the sexual dysfunction they suffered, and how these realities shaped their performance of masculinity in postbellum American society. In honor of her book's release, this week's episode will, with vast, vast, vast (laughs) chronological and geographical boundaries, explore the cultural history of impotence. I'm Marissa. And I am Sarah Handley Cousins. (laughs) And we are your historians for this episode of Dig. We want to give a big thank you to all of our Patreon supporters, particularly our Augur and Excavator level patrons. A very special thanks to Danielle, Lauren, Christopher, Colin, Maggie, and Peggy. Your generosity will go down in history. Listener, if you are not yet a patron, you can be. Just go to patreon.com slash digpodcast to learn more. 
So our current definition of impotence, so that is, so impotence, it really means a loss of power. But when we're talking about sexual impotence, we're talking about a loss of sexual power. That's like a very basic definition of what that might mean, right? This came into use during the 17th century, according to the Oxford English Dictionary. The Bible of words. Yes. Before that, sexual dysfunction was alluded to using various euphemisms, such as a loss or lack of desire. Um, there are several other things, just like, I don't know, ways of mm-hmm, mm-hmm. ways of conveying what you meant, right? right? According to Canadian historian Angus McLaren, whose history of impotence in Europe served as one of the important sources for this episode, impotence could mean any number of things. Erectile dysfunction, failure to penetrate a woman's vagina for mechanical or anatomical reasons, um, a failure to ejaculate, or a habit of ejaculating prematurely. So, does failure to bear a child prove male impotence? Not necessarily, right? I mean, you could be totally capable of penetrative sex and not mm-hmm. not conceive, right? Right. The issue of sexual performance, the act, is confused and conflated with sterility or barrenness, right. which is, you know, sometimes the consequence of the male performance right. of this act, right? So, does past fertility exonerate a man accused of impotence? Not necessarily, because you can, you know, impotence can be chronic and permanent, Mm -hmm. or it can be intermittent, Mm -hmm. it can be temporary, it can be psychological, Mm -hmm. it can be physiological. There's Mm -hmm. a lot of variations on how impotence can work. Absolutely. And and people historically understood this. Until the ad... Until the advent of sexual modernism around the early 20th century, impotence was regarded as a misfortune with much greater and more meaningful consequences than we consider today. A man's impotence, if it was known, precluded him from making marriages, annulled any marriages that he managed to contract, and destroyed his chances of producing progeny to carry on his family name. We see this somewhat in stories of royalty who struggled to beget children. The dynastic fate of patriarchal societies, such as those in Europe, the Mediterranean, and East Asia, rested on a man's ability to produce male heirs. Though, you know, to be fair, in most cases, it was actually the woman who was uh, considered the person at fault, not the man. Right. right. I mean, not Couldn't always. possibly be. Yeah. I mean, it wasn't always, but that was the first place that they Well, you think went. of, like, people like Anne Boleyn and, and mm-hmm. you know, who struggled to... Catherine de' Medici was another the one word that as I'm well. looking for? Conceive. Not just There's, conceive, but to, to bring a pregnancy to term right. you know, safely and healthily. That there must be something yeah. defective about her womb or right. something. Right. Yeah. So we're going way back. Oh, yes. Right? <laughs> so in Mesopotamia in the 7th century BCE. So that's the 7th century um, BC is the old way of saying it. Before Christ, right? Right. Before BCE the common means era. before common era. Right. Same thing. Men resorted to incantations and root medicine to resolve sexual problems. Ancient Mesopotamian medical authorities were called Asipu. They practiced a combination of science, witchcraft, religion, and herbology. We have evidence that they treated incontinence and other urogenital dysfunctions, but some historians believe they acted as sex therapists as well. Asipu were known to massage iron extracts and medicinal oils onto both male and female genitals in order to cure impotence. Oh my. (laughs) Joanne Skurlock and Burton Anderson argue that ancient Mesopotamians used medical marijuana to treat depression and nausea, but also to remedy impotence. Can I just pause here to say um, that this reminds me of Dan Savage, who does the sex podcast Savage Love, which I talk about all the time on this podcast. Mm -hmm. But, um, he actually recommends pot to people all the time when they're having problems with performance because really? it, it lowers your libido, but it also relaxes you. I mean, mm-hmm. I don't have a lot of experience with it, but I'm just right from what I've heard. <laughs> um, and so I just think that's interesting that that has an extremely long history. Yep. Um, they burned the, the marijuana plant in a hooded brazier and instructed patients to breathe in the smoke. Just as they do today, ancient practitioners experimented with several remedies. One Asipu medical text read, quote, If a man loses his potency, you dry and crush a male bat that is ready to mate. You put it in water, which is sat out on the roof, and you give it to him to drink. The man will then recover his potency. Hmm. (laughs) Desiccated bat water. (laughs) Yeah. Though historians still are hard at work uncovering the urogenital medical history of Mesopotamia, we know very little about the cultural meanings of impotence. 
Conversely, we know a lot about the cultural meaning of impotence in the ancient Mediterranean. The documentary evidence that survives from classical Greece, Phoenicia, Iran, Carthage, and later Rome dwarfs what we have for earlier civilizations. Our comparative familiarity with these cultures, plus the fact that Christianity was established in the area, are two reasons why so many scholars regard the Greco-Roman tradition as the parent civilization of Europe. You know, calling this all kind of like the Western world. Right. Once again, I have doubts, right? Mm-hmm. But to be fair, classical Greeks and Romans did seem to understand male virility in much the same way as we do today. Greek notions of masculinity are familiar to us. The ideal man was vigorous and passionate, but his tempestuousness was supposed to be tempered by a rational willpower. They did, famously, make space for casual, homosexual, and pedophilic relationships that, in today's sexual paradigm, might injure someone's masculinity. The Greco-Roman tradition was an embodied one. Social-emotional ideals were projected onto the body in a way that seems somewhat crude to us now. For example, the Greeks preferred the aesthetics of small penises because they felt that a small penis embodied the perfect combination of virility and rationality. They also believed that small penises were ideal for conception. Large phalluses were evil, ugly, and comical. Right. So there's this, like, one-to-one, like, hey, you know, your penis is, like, small size. So that means that you're not too masculine. You're, like, the perfect amount of masculine. It's, like, that's not how this works. You know, like, like, your anatomy doesn't directly correlate to your personality type. Amazing. But, But that is how they kind of thought of it. Yes. Um, the sexual attitude did not survive into the Roman Empire. Romans preferred large, erect penises, decorating with ceremonial phalluses everywhere and hosting celebrations for boys' first ejaculations. Roman authors bemoaned the humiliation and frustration tied to male sexual performance. In Roman society, the ideal man was aggressive and virile, but also authoritative, eloquent, and skilled at self-mastery. Roman men strove to appear strong and active at all times. Gender was performative. Male babies were born with penises, but they had to prove their masculinity by performing masculine activities and achieving masculine ideals. Roman literature enhanced and reinforced this masculine culture. To Roman authors, and to a lesser extent their Greek forebears, penetration defined success, and impotence, or flaccidity, It's a great word, flaccidity, Uh, defined failure. Angus McLaren argues that masculinity became synonymous with the impenetrable penetrator. Not only did penetration make one a man, but the act of being penetrated made one less of a man. McLaren suggests that this is tied to the Romans' inequitable social system. Patrician men had access to plebeian servants and slaves, and so were able to make their sexual wills known and satisfied. It followed logically, at least to them, that only servants and slaves could be made to perform acts like fellatio or to be penetrated by another man. Therefore, sexual impotence became inextricably linked to political impotence and a loss of social capital. Therefore, when Romans criticized their enemies, they called them soft. The Romans were also particularly skilled at martial analogies. They referred to the penis as a tool or a weapon used by soldiers to conquer the seas, defeat their enemies, and to enjoy their spoils. Forgive me if you're going to say this, but this is reflected in the language. The yeah, word, I... the, the Latin word for penis is like, is sword, is, is like from the same word as sword. And the Latin word for vagina is the same word as sheath. Um, but no, I didn't know that thing about the sword and sheath. Yes. I don't think. I don't. I mean, it sounds kind of familiar. Though sometimes it was the Persians, their enemies, I mean, mm-hmm. women were often cast as the enemy in this sexual play or maybe sexual battle, right? Mm-hmm. Physicians, politicians, literati, and most learned Greco-Roman philosophers contended that the female sex was defective. Mm-hmm. Women were prone to pathological arousal with libidos that remained uncontrolled by their tiny incompetent brains, <laughs> right? So the science of the sex act itself reinforced this belief by confirming that when men and women engaged in intercourse, the womb sucked heat, which was a life force Mm -hmm. from 
uh, her partner, right? Um, this, they reasoned, was why sexually promiscuous men and the elderly experienced sexual dysfunction. They were tapped out. All the heat was just sucked right out of them, yeah. right? Have you ever seen the movie Dr. Strangelove? No. <laughs> Dr. Strangelove is like a... I think it comes out in the 1960s. It's like an atomic age, very classic film of like the the paranoia that comes along with the nuclear bomb, right? Okay. And it's it's all about whether or not they're going to like bomb the the United States is going to bomb someplace. I can't remember all the details, but there's a character in it who is obsessed with this idea that women suck out men's um, vital forces mm-hmm. that they he calls them, like your manly essences, mm-hmm. and so like the, the they're gone and they're never coming back, and you need to like protect your manly essences. So it just reminds <laughs> right. me of that. Right, it's so that's so weird. No, I have heard of that movie before, um, but never seen it. I don't know. I don't watch old movies. It's a good one. It's a good one for like showing in class because it's like perfect for like the fifties and sixties. Anyway. This misogynist understanding of sexuality was, for ancient men, a double-edged sword. Men were the aggressive actors, and women were nothing more than uh, mere vessels. We see this in Greek theories of generation, which were, you know, borrowed by the Romans, as they you know, borrowed everything. Aeschylus wrote, quote, She who is called the mother is not her offspring's parent, but nurse to the newly sown embryo. The male, who mounts, begets. The female, a stranger, guards a stranger's child if no god bring him harm. So in other words, it's it's sort of like women actually have nothing to do with it. They're just sort of the host for this thing that men actually are responsible for. And they just kind of take care of them for a little while until they go out on their own. So women Mm -hmm. are just kind of like, I don't know, hosts, right? Yeah, hosts, Brood mares in a way. Yeah, vessels. But with great power... As Spider-Man once said, (laughs) comes great responsibility. It was a man's responsibility to successfully perform the sex act. And it was his seed that determined conception. This did not, of course, absolve women from any culpability for barrenness. But it did mean that Greco-Roman societies marked the male as the active ingredient in conception. So when sexual dysfunction or sterility plagued a relationship, the ultimate responsibility was his. And this was no small feat. Marrying and producing a male heir was essential to legal, social, and political well-being. This, as you can imagine, spawned countless medical investigations into the causes and treatments for impotence, right? Because when something impacts men very deeply, they're like, let's get this figured well, out. We need to get to the bottom of this. Right. Let's, like, you know, uh, government funding for this, like, thing, right? So natural scientists um, developed herbal and nutritional cures for ingestion um, and topical application. In fact, male heirs were so crucial that given the lack of a magical cure for impotence and sterility, adoption was used to remedy productive failures. And this is something that's really common in the ancient world that we see um, men who were unable to beget their own heirs would adopt, you know, like a nephew or Mm -hmm. even Mm -hmm. like a poor slave boy or something, like adopt him and turn him into like a patrician boy. Lots of strange um, adoptive dramas going on right isn't this what um I, i'm reaching way back to my latin class when i was in high school so i could be butchering this but i think that this is what julius caesar does with augustus mm-hmm. right augustus is like yep. an adopted son right? yeah cool i think he was like a a, a, a relative or, somehow yeah, right. like a distant nephew yeah oh mr Wittish would be so happy and proud of me <laughs> While the Romans struggled to maintain their overgrown empire in the 280s CE, the Chinese were making great strides in the study of sexuality. The Chinese were arguably the inventors of what some now call sexology. This was in part due to the fall of the Han Dynasty in 220 CE, which triggered what was called the Three Kingdoms period. During this time, three Chinese dynasties competed for ascendancy to a unified throne. The Northern Dynasty, the Wei, recognized Taoism by then, which was nearly a millennium old, as the official state religion. From this point until the end of the Tang Dynasty around 907 CE, Chinese Taoists developed the Fang Zhang Shu, which translates to the arts of the bedchamber. Arts of the bedchamber. Yes. Well, it's a it's like a collection of texts. 
During this period, the Chinese developed and recorded sexual philosophies and practices that came to be censored during later dynasties. Fun fact, they they may have invented Kegels, and if they didn't invent Kegels, they developed the practice of Kegels. <laughs> um, much beyond, uh, you know, I think... How do you there's... develop the practice of Kegels? You oh, you'll see. Kegels? Oh, no. Oh, no. You develop the practice of Kegels. And we'll get that to that in a minute. Um, Taoists uh, regarded semen as the bodily fluid that contained the most essence, or jing. They encouraged believers to conserve their semen, right? So this is actually kind of familiar to 19th century, uh, or similar to 19th mm-hmm. century American sexual advice, where you yeah. want to keep that semen in your body. Reserve your Don't masturbate essences. and, yeah, don't squander your essences, mm-hmm. right? Um, so they wanted to either conserve their semen, or more compellingly, to redirect the essence towards their brains, right? <laughs> <laughs> it's not funny, okay? It's oh, like a sorry. real thing. Sorry, I'm, sorry. I'm kidding. <laughs> it is kind of funny. Because um, you're like, what do you, how do you get semen in your, in your brain? Um, so they therefore attempted retrograde ejaculation, which is the reflux of ejaculate into the bladder by applying force to the perineum during ejaculation. Uh, they believed their essence would, instead of being expelled, travel up their body to nourish their brain. This is a not so fun fact, like the Kegel fact, because <laughs> um, I and I don't even want to say it, but I have to say it. Um, in the Tao Te Ching, uh, male babies are described as the most virile humans possible because they're able to achieve erections without ejaculating and without any exposure to adult sexual practice. Mm, okay, so it's like the purest of boners, I guess. It's like it's so, it's so gross to think about, but if you think about it, it really makes sense, yes. right? This Taoist understanding of male virility is quite different from the Mediterranean understanding that we discussed earlier and the European one we'll get to soon. And, uh, you know, since neither of us are experts in Chinese history, we're kind of offering a generalist point of view. We should um, make sure that people realize that. Um, But even for a medieval Taoist, erectile dysfunction was a problem. One could not engage in sexual practice or achieve ejaculation in any form without maintaining healthy erections. Taoists develop exercises that are still used today, which are meant to improve virility and stave off male and female impotence. The deer exercise, a prescribed combination of massage and anal contraction, um, treated male impotence, but it was also prescribed to women to prevent menstruation. The deer exercise is still used to diagnose and cure sexual dysfunction today. And it involves, like, Kegel-like things um nipple stimulation clitoral stimulation for women and then for men it's actually not that penile i don't know it's a, it's a big thing i mean if you look at like yoga books like that that are give you yoga poses and things like this is one of the ones <laughs> I know, it's if intense. you look at yoga books there are parts well, where like and now rub your nipple no. and also <laughs> <laughs> yoga books that are that are specifically aimed towards sexual health and sexual function. Oh, jeepers. Um, or urogenital uh, health. Like, there are actual, you know, kind of practices that are aimed towards that. Those will include the deer. Okay. The practice of Tao sexology waned during the fall of the Tang dynasty around 907 CE. Indeed, the arts of the bedchamber underwent successive waves of repression by the next two Chinese dynasties. Still, Chinese physicians absorbed some of the Taoist teachings on sexology. Beyond Taoist teachings, their medical expertise was expansive, easily surpassing that of any other region in Asia. During the 7th to 11th centuries, Japanese physicians were sent to China to study Chinese medicine. They compiled a 30-volume medical text called the Ishinho, which is known as the earliest Japanese medical text to ever exist, though it wasn't actually published until the 19th century. Right. It existed in manuscript form until then. According to the Ishinho, impotence was a problem that the Chinese were intent on solving. One centuries-old treatment for impotence was the topical application of a mercury compound to the penis. Mm, That'll do it. Another section recommended the combination of five herbal ingredients mixed with rice wine and taken three times per day to resolve erectile dysfunction. According to this recipe... A governor of Shu Commandery in Sichuan got a child when he was over 70 by using the enclosed prescription. 
Right. So this idea is like this prescription is so good that even like elderly impotence can be solved. So it must be like what Charlie Chaplin was using. Why did Charlie Chaplin have a kid when he was like 80 or something? I think so. Oh. I may have just made Hilarious. That. But that's like an old joke. Or like, it's maybe like what like my women, dad was using. When women I like, was like 50 when he, or he was 50 when I was born. Right. Like, but right. The, the, it was like a, Charlie Chaplin always comes up when you talk about how like women have like very strict biological clocks mm-hmm. and men can just like have, have children babies forever. forever. Yeah. Right. From the 8th to the 12th centuries, Arab and Persian medical scientists such as Ibn Sina, Masudi, and Al-Zarawi labored over ancient Indian and Greco-Roman medical texts. Most of the texts had been translated from their original languages in the House of Wisdom, a government-funded Islamic intellectual center in Baghdad, which was opened in the 8th century. Islamic scholars wrote critical commentaries of ancient texts and conducted their own clinical research, adding immeasurably to ancient bodies of knowledge. So I'm going to go on a little tiny rant here because I just <laughs> I just decided to. An important rant, though. Important rant. So this is one of the reasons why I object to the term Western world, and it's because people who use it often exclude the Islamic world from the Western world, um, when theologically, scientifically, historically, it's very central to the Western right. world. There was no disconnection between those Ever. two things. Right. Yeah. So that being said, there was much less crossover between the regions practicing pagan and Abrahamic religions, Abrahamic religions meaning Judaism, um, Christianity, Islam, right? Um, A lot less crossover between those areas and then the East Asian cultures that were more influenced by Tao, Confucianism, animism. So there was a little less, I mean, not, there wasn't none, but there was a little less crossover between those. So if you're going to use the term Western world in that sense of meaning like East Asia versus everyone else, then like maybe it makes a little bit of sense. But to exclude the Muslim world... Makes zero is, sense. Right. And like, it's, this it's is not a accurate. big thing right now. There's a, like a, a, a big move by, to put it very bluntly, white supremacists to sort of reclaim this idea of the Western world and right. Western civilization. Um, and it's like, is, okay, well, fine, but right. that 110% includes Islam. Right. Then. Yeah. Like, which they're not willing to. No, and their vision of, be, of Western civ is not what you are describing, right? right? Their vision of Western Civ is one that excludes everyone except for right. inexplicably the Mediterranean and Europe. Like Which is crazy because the Mediterranean is, is a third African yes. <laughs> and one third right. Middle Eastern. Right. So like what the F. Yeah. There was but like even in art and sculpture and all of that, we know that there were incredible amounts of people of color living in places like greek greek absolutely in greece and rome right like it's not like they have this vision of like right. a purely white perfect one of the civilization like most powerful you know um monarchies in a- the ancient world egypt mm-hmm. also super powerful trading city yeah. carthage these are all african right. <laughs> right right and it drives me like carthage the Phoenicians. Carth- right yeah like th- these are all africans right, right? Um, so, so yeah, so that's why I, I hate saying yeah. Western world, but when I say it, I mean, um, not East Asian, which is a, a very kind yes. of different, um, understanding of spirituality mm-hmm. than we have with the Abrahamic religions. Absolutely. So, so that's all I mean by that. Yes. So, so it, yes, a tangent, but I think yeah. a really important <laughs> tangent and, and right now in our political moment, right. a tangent that might be worth having, you know, maybe we have more of a discussion about that right. later or on. Right, maybe an episode or something. So, um... Anyhow, the moral of the story is that the Islamic translation movement, which which started um, with with really the beginning of Islam and the Umayyad uh, Caliphate, um, the translation movement is responsible for the transmission of Greco-Roman and Indo-Aryan medical knowledge to Christian Europe. Right. So instead of rehashing what all the ancients thought and what the Persians and Arabs thought about what they thought, um, I'd like to take a detour for a moment so we can discuss one aspect of impotence that the Persian scholar Masudi contributed to the conversation. Impotence magic. Or as I like to call it, boner curses. (laughs) So for this, um, we'll have to move to medieval Europe. That's okay with me. Impotence magic was not invented in medieval Europe. The Mesopotamian incantations we mentioned earlier in the episode were meant to counteract some kind of bewitching. Greek traveler and writer Herodotus wrote about the Egyptian pharaoh 
Amasis, who had been cursed with impotence by his wife, and that the curse was only lifted once she prayed to Aphrodite. The Persian Masudi wrote about it extensively in his medical encyclopedia, Kitab al-Milaki. Constantine the African, who was purportedly a Christian convert from Islam, translated Masudi's medical text into the Pantagni in the 1070s or 1080s. But the dark art of penile curses was perfected in late medieval Western Europe, according to historian Catherine Ryder. Part of this comes down to source availability. Impotence was found in some ancient medical texts, as we've already discussed, but it does not appear in legal documents. This is different from the medieval period, where the bulk of historical documentation dealing with impotence is found in court testimonies and legal summaries. Much of this can be attributed to the codification of Christian doctrine during the early Middle Ages. So there's very little documentation of sexuality in the apostolic, which is the early Christian church. But by the 6th century CE, Christian sexual morality was beginning to shape legal policy. It was during the reign of Christian Roman Emperor uh, Justinian, which, so he reigned from 526 to 565 CE, that impotence became grounds for divorce. Prior to that period, mutual divorce was legal, so there's no reason for church courts to litigate over sexual dysfunction. Like, there's no reason for it to be recorded. People could have gotten divorced because of impotence, but since you can get a divorce for any reason, nobody had to litigate on impotence. Like, it didn't matter. Um, there was initially very little differentiation between love magic and impotence magic. For much of the medieval period, Ordinary people failed to differentiate between love spells and impotent spells, since either could result in the dissolution of a marriage. Christian theologians discussed impotence as it related to Christian doctrine, but their conclusions were contradictory. Hinkmar, the Frankish Archbishop of Ram, which is where, um, Ram. which is where uh, Jean d'Arc is from, Joan of Arc. Um, believed that impotence, so Hinkmar believed that impotence was a legitimate reason for the annulment of a marriage. Pope Gregory II, which is, he was his contemporary and fellow theologian, agreed. In the 720s, Pope Gregory II wrote that in the case of impotence within a marriage, the couple should remain married and live together as brother and sister, but that they should not be punished if they felt they could not live together with that solution they should be allowed to dissolve their marriage. Gregory, however, specified that the impotent spouse, which is almost always the male, but in some cases a woman who was unable to perform the sex act, you know, for one reason or another, should not be allowed by ecclesiastical law to remarry. Hinkmar disagreed, arguing that both spouses should be allowed to remarry after the dissolution of a marriage on the grounds of impotence. Should the impotent spouse prove to be capable of the sex act at a later date, Hinkmar argued that the marriage dissolution should stand, while Pope Gregory II argued that the first marriage should just be reconstituted. Gregory reasoned that the marriage annulment would have been faulty in the first place if the impotence was not permanent. Gregory's theology, when it was enforced in ecclesiastical courts or codified into civil law, gave the impotent few choices. He was unable to legally marry, which brought both companionship and legal benefits, and unable to sire legitimate children, which gave life meaning, but also allowed for the concentration of property by notable families. As missionaries spread Christian doctrine, however, the evil, idolatrous nature of pagan practices was continually preached and reinforced. By 1100 CE or so, it was imperative that pagan practices be categorized as either harmless and be absorbed into the fabric of Christendom, or uh, be categorized as evil, in which case it would be suppressed. Impotence magic was categorized as irrefutably evil, maleficium. Mm. Initially, though, these theological spats meant little for the everyday lives of ordinary European Christians. Guibert of Noge, a Benedictine monk in the 11 teens, uh, wrote of his father's seven-year-long impotence due to an impotence spell. Guibert's father had purportedly upset a local woman with his choice of wife. She had suggested her niece as a match, but he chose to marry Guibert's mother instead. In revenge, she cursed him with impotence for a period of seven years. Ouch. Guibert wrote, 
quote, these arts are so frequently practiced among the populace that they are known by all uneducated people. There was regional disagreement on how impotence magic should be dealt with in Catholic ecclesiastical courts. While French ecclesiastical courts annulled marriage on the grounds of impotence by maleficium, Roman Catholic church courts did not. Right. So there's like not really any agreement on how mm. we're dealing with this. The boner curse. Boner curse, right? <laughs> As the Christian canon hardened and ecclesiastical courts exercised their authorities over Western Europe, both ordinary people and church authorities became preoccupied with impotence magic. Catherine Ryder writes that after 1100, impotence magic was legitimized by the three university disciplines that acknowledged its presence and made impotence magic the subject of serious inquiry. Canon law, theology, and medicine. So these are three practices that people go to university for, right? Mm -hmm. Right. At the same time, the laity's concern over impotence magic is documented in pastoral manuals, which instructed priests on how to counsel the laity, but also in hagiographies and narrative histories. So we kind of, we know that not only were these like fancy learned people concerned about impotence magic, but actually just regular old people were, because we know that their priests were being instructed to help them with impotence curse issues, right? <laughs> Ryder argues convincingly that impotence magic acts as a nexus between popular culture and academic culture in medieval Europe. It does appear that canon law and theology mingled meaningfully with popular pagan tradition during this time. The following story, recorded in Ryder's monograph, was originally told in 1216. Uh, the story goes like this. It happened once in Paris that a certain sorceress impeded a man who had left her so that he could not have intercourse with another woman whom he had married. So she made an incantation over a closed lock and threw that lock into a well and the key into another well and the man was made impotent. But afterwards, when the sorceress was forced to acknowledge the truth, the lock was retrieved from the one well and the key from the other well. And as soon as the lock was opened, uh, the man <laughs> became able to have intercourse with his wife. I'm taking Did that out. <laughs> that story have any... What? I think that that was also when all of the servants turned into, like, clocks and tables and, like, um, they turned into wardrobes. And it was you actually Beauty and the Beast. Because <laughs> <laughs> it was set in France. France. It was set in France <laughs> in 1216, but I thought that the Beauty and the Beast was set in France in the 17th century. It was a joke, Marissa. Oh, it was a joke. <laughs> okay. I thought you were trying to say that it's like a... No. Like a, like a mythology that they keep reenacting. It was reenacting. Just the only other French myth story that I knew uh, that involved the sources. <laughs> um, so this portrayal of impotence magic became increasingly compelling to medieval Europeans. At the same time, Christian demonology and the mythology surrounding witchcraft grew exponentially more complex. The early medieval disdain for pagan ritual was transformed into full-blown ecclesiastical paranoia. Rather than follow the pagan Christian canonical framework of earlier claims of impotence magic, later medieval and early modern narratives of impotence magic relied on contemporary demonology and heterodox Christian doctrine concerning witchcraft. So instead of having these stories that are kind of rooted in these old pagan um, traditions mixed with some kind of Christian doctrine, mm -hmm. they're suddenly having these uh, accusations of impotence magic that are, like, um, falling in line with uh, witchcraft panics, basically. Right, yeah. So Parisian physician Jacques Depart wrote in 1427... I know a certain count who said to a newly married knight, you see this strap? He replied that he did. The count said to him, I will tie it. And until I untie it, you will not be able to have intercourse with your wife completely. This happened. And as the knight swore to me and to others, although he was sexually very potent and his wife was beautiful and full of energy and 20 years old. Oh my. So even though he was very potent and his wife was young and beautiful and energetic, they were unable to have sex until this guy untied the knot. Mm -hmm. So the tying of knots, known as the aiguillette, 
was a prominent aspect of the new doctrines on early modern witchcraft. In 1486, Inquisitor Heinrich Kramer and Dominican friar Jakob Sprenger wrote Malleus Maleficarum, a text that reinforced the growing conception of the devil-worshipping witch and aroused witchcraft paranoia on a massive scale. Witchcraft trials in continental Europe, Britain, and the American colonies peaked from 1560 to 1630. An estimated 50,000 people were burned at the stake or, in America, hanged. Or crushed under rocks. Or crushed under rocks. Or sometimes (laughs) drowned, I think, too. Mm. But most people were burned in Europe and hanged in America. Right. Impotence magic was an important aspect of early modern witchcraft. Witchcraft hysteria followed two models. It either, one, arose to explain misfortune, such as impotence, sour milk, storms, etc. Right. Or, alternatively, it was based on an entirely fabricated fantastical event that just never happened. Uh, Impotence was thus complicit in triggering and legitimizing witchcraft hysteria. So, because... You know, there were some which some witchcraft hysteria was like, oh, well, I saw her, you know, I saw the devil sucking from her uh, witch's teat or whatever. Mm-hmm. Um, but it's like, you know, that's that literally 100% made up. Right, <laughs> but right. but uh, if someone was suffering from sudden impotence or whatever, yeah, which is after kind of, they, they were mean to someone. Or right. Whatever, and it, then, that's difficult to explain anyway. And right. so why did this suddenly just happen to me? Well... That right. lady's been, you know, she's had it in for me for years, and now suddenly here I am with this problem. Like, right. put two and two together. Yeah, you know? exactly. So it, it, like, bolstered all, like, these claims right. of witchcraft. Kramer and Sprenger drew heavily on Thomas Aquinas's and St. Bonaventure's treatises on impotence magic. They wrote, quote, Men are very often bewitched in this way because they have cast off their former mistresses, who, hoping that they were to be married and being disappointed, so bewitch the men that they cannot copulate with other women. Kramer and Sprenger described how one can know whether their impotence had natural causes or whether it was the result of witchcraft. They borrow from Italian canonist Henry of Seguzio. Quote, when the member is in no way stirred and can never perform the act of coition, this is a sign of frigidity of nature. But when it is stirred and becomes erect, but yet cannot perform, it is a sign of witchcraft. Ugh. Which is crazy because I feel like most impotence works that way, where it's like, yes. you know, you can like start a little something, mm-hmm. but you can, it can't continue it, mm-hmm. and it's, like, intermittent and kind of Probably random. much more common than right. being completely unable right. to, you know... Perform at all. At all. Ever. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Uh, Kramer and Spranger also proposed solutions for how to handle impotence magic in ecclesiastical courts and within the confessional. In courts, they suggest it should be ascertained if the impotence curse is permanent or temporary. If temporary... And by their definition, uh, temporary, determining if something is temporary involves constant experimentation for the course of three years to no avail. Jeepers. Then that, like, you have to do that to figure out if it's temporary or not, uh-huh. right? So right. if it's temporary, um, the marriage is not dissolvable because right. you can get your mojo back, right? If three years have passed and the impotent party has done all they can to reverse the condition to no avail, then the marriage should be dissolved by the church. Can I talk about penises and baskets now? (laughs) Yes. Um, I just want to interject that Kramer and Sprenger were like sort of obsessed with witchcraft and female sexuality and like female women um, sort of controlling men and men's sexuality. Like this comes up over and over again in Malleus Maleficarum and obviously the ways that we've mentioned before, but there's also this part that I always talk about with my students, mostly because it like freaks them out where they like in sort of hysterical terms, talk about how women will like use enchantments to actually remove the penises from men's bodies. And then they gather them up in baskets and put them in trees. And like, they live like, like birds basically like they are living creatures that sort of live independently in these trees and there's these great um illustrations of like women walking underneath trees that are full of dicks and like (laughs) collecting them in their baskets and there's like some something in there about like you know okay yeah we understand that like their penises aren't actually coming off of their bodies like they're they're 
pe- you can still see the penis on their body, but it's like the essence of penis mm-hmm. has been taken, which I wonder, right. I've never thought about it in terms of, uh, of impotence, but I wonder if that's what they're talking about. If the yeah. essence of penis has been taken. I do wonder. Taken. I always thought that it meant like, like a metaphorical castration. Yes. Like, like we're take like impotence in this, the way of like not being powerful mm-hmm. politically, like yes. political impotence. Right. And, like, sexual impotence have always sort of, like, been intertwined. Right. And so the idea is that these women are, Castrating. Like, taking yeah. the power from these men. Yeah. That's right. really... But it's, like, so strange to think that somebody would look at that picture of, like, a woman walking around under, like, trees of dicks and, like... And see, like, a metaphorical thing. Right. I mean, rather, it must yeah. have been a metaphorical right. thing. Like, I find it very hard to believe that People believe anybody thought that, that was actually dicks happening. were falling off. Yeah. Right. Well. <laughs> I don't know. I mean, they believe some pretty weird things. They did. But. But they had physical evidence they could see on a man. Like, there is still That a it still existed there. there. Right. But right. it just didn't work. So you would think it's kind of a little bit more metaphorical. Right. Right. As Kramer and Spranger suggested, the church supported any remedy for impotence by maleficium, even if the remedy was something that went against church doctrine. Quote, the church may well tolerate the suppression of vanities by means of other vanities. Ecclesiastical authorities encouraged medical experimentation on this front. Indeed, the European Renaissance drew heavily on Persian and Arab scholarship of the non-magical variety. It was Islamic translations of Aristotle and Galen that that served as the basis for anatomical study in the 16th century. And we talked about this, I think you talked about this in the episode on forensic pathology. Right, like Vesalius and dissection. Yes, yes. The 16th century witnessed the birth of the fields of embryology, obstetrics, and gynecology. Get it? Birth of the fields? Oh, so clever. You didn't even get it. So clever. (laughs) Uh, So impotence continued to be of interest to medical scientists. At the same time, the Protestant Reformation triggered tomes of theology about marriage. Remember, you know, one of the the major protests during the Protestant Reformation was this idea that priests should be able to marry and that married life was just as holy as an abstinent one. The Protestant Reformation revived the legal battles waged in ecclesiastical and now criminal and civil courts regarding the legality of marriages suffering from impotence. The medical, religious, and legal problems surrounding sexual impotence were played out on the national stage in the 16th and 17th centuries, owing to the unification of most European states, except Italy and Germany, under powerful centralized monarchies. Except the Swiss Confederacy. (laughs) I just want to be accurate. Um, I don't want to (laughs) generalize too much, okay? So in this period, um, you know, so I'm trying to say that this is a period of uh, unification of nation states, okay? So in this period, the virility of European monarchs was a civic matter. Queens were often suspected of spoiling royal bloodlines by committing adultery or, in the case of Queen Mary of Modesta, who's the wife of England's James II, um, they were suspected of having put a changeling on the throne um, to disguise their own barrenness. The specter of impotence, however, haunted kings as well. An inability to sire children could result in courtly rumor, but also political unrest and diplomatic nightmares. Henry II of France and Catherine de' Medici are thought to have experienced sexual dysfunction. They failed to produce an heir for nearly 11 years into their marriage, despite reports that they engaged in dutiful intercourse. (laughs) Ah, the best kind of intercourse. (laughs) Dutiful intercourse. Catherine was initially accused of barrenness, especially by those who did not know the king intimately. He had conducted several affairs and sired an illegitimate child from one of those unions. At court, however, his genital abnormalities were an open secret. His doctor had diagnosed him with a congenital defect of the penis. He had two conditions we now call hypospadias and chordi, which hampered the mechanics of conception, at least with Catherine. Let me interject. Yes. To, I just assumed everybody would, like, I don't know, look those up. Yeah, we should probably define them. Right. So, hypospadias Mm -hmm. is when the urethra, the opening to the urethra occurs instead of, like, at the tip of the penis. Underneath, down on the shaft. Mm -hmm. And then, chordi is a condition where the penis is very, uh, like, bent. Like, curved. Very curved. Yeah. Like, not just, like... 
a gentle slope, but like a no, <laughs> profound, curve. like profoundly curved. Right. Um, usually like downwards, like a, like a sled, like, or no, but a, like an upside down sled. Right. <laughs> like, you know, yes. like that's all I can, yeah, like reason, a toboggan. Yes. I understand. That's all saying. I can like think of is like yes. that. Right. Right. Um, so they think that a lot of times, like, mechanically what was happening was just like because everybody's um vagina their everyone's vaginal canal is shaped differently right. and goes at different angles and all stuff so what they think was happening was like when they were having sex everything was working okay but because of um the mechanics of his between penis, those two yeah issues, they, right. he was sort of scraping everything out and you know like yes. not uh, yeah if it, the hypospadia was on the bottom of his penis and right. he was ejaculating and then it was kind yeah. of yeah not well, right not being not optimally placed right. t- in order for a sperm to travel up and right, whatever. Right. Yeah. So it would not impossible to get pregnant, but difficult. Right. right. And they're only having dutiful intercourse. They're not like right. they're not, having tons of yeah. fun intercourse. You can right? see how if they were like, you know, having lots and lots of like happy, wonderful sex. Right. That maybe it would have increased their chances. But if you're only right. having dutiful intercourse anyway, right. and you have all these <laughs> other hurdles. Right. That's going to make it very It's difficult. an issue. Right. Yeah. So uh, anyway, so coming back around to this, the story about Henry II and Catherine de Medici. Um, once Henry consulted a physician on the matter, he was instructed to penetrate his wife from behind rather than, you know, above and a kind of a customary missionary style. And then. They went on to have 10 legitimate children. So, you know, as we were just kind of saying, you know, changing things up a little bit seemed to to fix that. You know, right. All those kind of hurdles they had to get over. Right. It's interesting because yeah. they actually had physicians, like, um, inspect her and him. Mm. And they had to, like, consult each other about, like, their sexual... Um, compatibility. It's funny. Like, it's like experts and it, look at you, and then experts right. look at you, and then they are going to discuss. And then they're like, your "This genitalia. is how you should bone." <laughs> right. Like, but you know, yeah. I mean, this kind of stuff like happens. Like, there's weird mechanical yeah. things yeah. having to do with sex that that you know, it's just a thing. Yes, it's a um, completely normal thing. Yeah. So it's really, but but it's interesting that that they couldn't figure out it, they couldn't figure it out themselves because right. they like weren't going to be talking to each other about it. They right, just. Right. Dutifully did intercourse and then, you know, went their right. separate ways. Yeah, I think so. that dutiful, the dutiful thing there is so important, right? <laughs> yeah. I mean, I was kind of picking on it, but it's really important because if it was a different kind of relationship, you might naturally just right. be trying different positions and right. seeing what worked, you know? Right. And if you're it's kind of trapped in this dutiful relationship, then it might feel like, no, this is how we're supposed to be. Right. Know? And I don't understand why it's not working. Right. And yeah. So then they figured it out. Ten children. Ten. It's Good crazy. job, Catherine. Jeez. So um, their son, Henry III, uh, so, so the son of Henry II and Catherine de Medici, was suspected of impotence also. His 14-year marriage to Louise of Lorraine produced no children. His enemies accused him of buggery, which is sodomy, so basically anal sex, I guess, um, with a contingent of young men who came to be called his mignon, which is so cute. I just, like, love it. It means, like, little cutes. Like, like just, minions. Yes, but it's spelled differently, and it's pronounced mignon. And they presumably were not little, like, yellow creatures. No, they were, like, men, <laughs> but they were little cutes. Um... So some historians have uh, decoded their marital sterility and the presence of the mignon as proof of his sexual preference for men. So most, not most, but a a lot of historians um, suspect he was gay. Suspicions of impotence could easily um, spill over into accusations of sodomy or uh, effeminacy, right? Um, These sins or crimes... I mean, I, th- that's in quotes, obviously, right. um, were dangerous for monarchs if they faced the social and political pressures faced by Henry III. So Henry was the fourth son of Henry and Catherine of Medici, who we just discussed above. Um, his eldest brother, Francis the second, had died young. He was the husband of Mary, Queen of Scots. Okay. Mm-hmm. I think he died when he was like 12 or something like that, 13. And he um, was the husband of Mary Queen. Yeah, of no, I think they oh. maybe, maybe he got married when he was twelve, and he died when he was fifteen, something like that. Okay. Very, very young, right? Um, the next brother died as an infant, and the third brother, Charles the Ninth, he's the one who ordered the Saint Bartholomew's Day massacre. He died without a male heir. So Henry the Third's inability to produce an heir led to a civil war and succession crisis, 
called the War of the Three Henrys, which is cute. <laughs> so, um, and this is between him and Henry of Guise and Henry of Navarre, who Henry of Navarre did end up being uh, Henry the Fourth. So, um, he was like the Protestant king who ended the wars of religion and blah blah blah. But anyway. <laughs> So, so for Henry III, his sexual impotence, whether it was medical or due to a profoundly inflexible sexual preference, like you couldn't even get yourself to bone your wife, like ever, like, I mean, okay, you know, resulted in um, the political impotence of the French court. And it won't be the last time for France, but more on that below. Oh, France. Below? You mean later? Later? I mean, it is below if they're reading. But they're not reading. They're listening. Okay. (sighs) Ah. Henry VIII of England is suspected to have suffered from intermittent impotence, especially in the last years of his life. Some instances have been proven to be part of the courtly machinations surrounding his six ill-fated marriages. But in at least one instance, Henry VIII admitted to his inability to perform, though he shifted the blame to his new wife, Anne of Cleves. Oh, poor Anne of Cleves. Uh, Although I shouldn't say, oh, poor Anne of Cleves, because, you know, she didn't die. He told his minister, Thomas Cromwell, that he had done, quote, as much to move the consent of his heart and mind as ever man did, but he failed to have intercourse with the queen because he, according to him, said that he found her body disgusting. I think he used the word loathsome. Yeah. Did he make a big deal out of, like, the fact that he thought she was, like, very ugly and Mm -hmm. everything? Yeah. Which is like, okay, calm down. Yeah, and oh, not to mention that he was, like, overweight and had, like, a separating <laughs> wound on yeah. his leg and was, like, himself disgusting. And so. had just, like, murdered oh, right. one of his wives. <laughs> right. Um, so uh, he also tried to shift the blame for his impotence on Anne of Cleves in another way, and this is by doubting her virginity. So according to Cromwell, quote, he mistrusted her to be no maid by reason of the looseness of her breasts and other tokens, which, when he felt them, struck him so to the heart that he had neither will nor courage to prove the rest and left her as good a maid as he found her, end Whatever. quote. Whatever. It's like, you're such a... <laughs> like her boobs were saggy like come like whatever i don't know it's so it makes me angry so um the three physicians henry consulted about his impotence with anne secretly suspected he was unwell but most historians believe that he purposely avoided consummating the marriage because he had his eye on an annulment and he knew that if it right. happened it wouldn't they couldn't have an annulment so nonetheless henry's ability to perform was hotly contested at court especially since he went on to annul his marriage to anne uh, and marry twice more without issue. So no more kids, right? Right. The impotence of Charles II of Spain was broadcast after his death and subsequent autopsy in 1700. Uh, We mentioned him in the first episode of our eugenics series because um, his life and death ignited such interest in human heredity. Charles II's atrophied testicles were used to demonstrate the unfortunate consequences of Habsburg inbreeding, uh, in other words, uh, hereditary monarchy. Charles II's disabilities, including his impotence, were marshaled as proof by Republican revolutionaries and other anti-monarchical groups that monarchies were unnatural and tyrannical. Opponents of monarchy conjured images of a hypothetical, mad, monstrous, and impotent tyrant that ruled his kingdom without the benefits of bodily health or learned reason. Similarly to Henry III of France, so he's the one who we think was gay, right? Mm -hmm, Right. Um, Whose impotence launched the War of the Three Henrys, the purported impotence of Louis XVI of France is often interpreted as having launched a revolution. Louis XVI was feared impotent after his marriage to Marie Antoinette initially failed to produce heirs. It took seven years of marriage for the couple to conceive a child. Historians have squabbled over the cause of Louis XVI's impotence. He was known to have overly tight foreskin, um, a condition we now call phimosis, and it's unclear if he underwent an operation to correct it. Um, One of the criticisms of Louis was that he was a coward because his doctors kept saying, let us, you know, uh, loosen your foreskin and and do this operation, and he kept refusing to do it. Uh, And uh, it's unclear if he actually ever got it done or not. I think the assumption is that he didn't, but it's possible possible that he did. Phimosis is common in adolescence and can cause painful erections. Louis was merely 15 when he married Marie Antoinette, so this kind of fits. 
His youth may have also contributed to his naivete and his immaturity. So after discussing uh, with Louis, Louis XVI's brother-in-law, so this is Marie Antoinette's brother, Emperor Joseph II of Austria, called the couple two complete blunderers. According to Joseph, Louis and his new wife had no idea how to have sex. Quote, he has strong erections. He inserts his member, remains there for perhaps two minutes without moving, withdraws without ejaculating, and while still erect, bids goodnight. <laughs> <laughs> That's one of my favorite. I remember this. I, I remember this distinctly from the movie Marie Antoinette. Oh, yeah. <laughs> With Kirsten Dunst. <laughs> yes. Yeah. I remember there being a scene where it was like just really odd, like this yeah. really bizarre sexual encounter. Regarding Louis' level of sexual desire, Joseph writes, quote, He's satisfied, saying he does it only out of a sense of duty, but he has no desire for it. This comment, paired with the fact that Louis XVI was the only French monarch without a mistress, has led historians to conclude that Louis may have suffered from hypogonadism. Which, um, should we define hypogonadism? Yeah, sort of like uh, underdeveloped, uh, probably like low testosterone, mm. underdeveloped, um, testicles mm -hmm. so could that mean small testicles or just like hormonally i think they mean it in a hormonal sense mm. like a low libido got it pathologically low libido. Yeah, yeah after taking the advice of his confidants the couple were able to conceive several children but for french subjects the damage had already been done louis the 16th's predecessor and his grandfather, um, the womanizing Louis the Fifteenth, had angered French notables when he ceded political power to his mistresses. So we had Madame de Pompadour, mm -hmm. remember, and right. Madame du Barry, I think her name was. Um, so he, he kind of gave them more political power than they should have had, mm -hmm. or that's how his subjects felt. Though Louis the Fifteenth and the Sixteenth could not have been more different men, the younger Louis's impotence, his lack of sexual prowess. In short, his bumbling inability to penetrate his wife revived French subjects' displeasure with the monarchy. Critics called the monarchy itself, so not just Louis, but the monarchy, mm -hmm. impotent, effeminate, corrupt, ineffective. Political pamphlets depicting Louis XVI as a flaccid penis or as a humanoid penis with a defective glands. It's such a, it's like a human wow. with a glands head, right? Interesting. That, and the glands is like kind of split in half. Um... These uh, circulated in, you know, pamphlets around the capital. Right. So the cultural meaning of impotence for French subjects came to be conflated with disquiet caused by widespread hunger, political corruption, and hereditary tax exemption. So all of these things are kind of like boiling together. Yeah, yeah. And yes, this really does matter to people. French historians and authors are still arguing bitterly about Louis and Marie Antoinette's sexual dysfunction. Author Simone Berthier, for example, has argued that historians have gotten the couple all wrong. Berthier argues that no, Louis was not a foppish, effeminate, and sexually incompetent king. She claims that most evidence suggests that Louis XVI had a very large penis and that Marie Antoinette had a very narrow vagina and that their sexual dysfunction was a matter of mere incompatibility. It is tempting to conclude that French authors are anxious to rehabilitate Louis XVI's masculinity retroactively. Can right. I pause there? Can you say something about how the f this person would know that that Marie Antoinette had a very narrow vagina and he had a very large penis? Like, is that... It appeared in an article called Size Did Matter to Marie Antoinette <laughs> in The Guardian. <laughs> That's amazing. It's so stupid. <laughs> well, like, I actually kind of get it, because, like, there are so many times where I was, like, pun I was, like, yeah. punning, like, You're crazy. Right. Like, how could you not? I don't know. Simone Bettier comes to this conclusion because she's kind of working off of this influential biography of Marie Antoinette that was written by Stefan Zweig in Vienna in 1932. And she argues that Zweig comes to these conclusions about the famosis and everything because he looked at letters between Marie Antoinette and her mother, the Empress Marie Theresa. Um, but he didn't compare those letters to the letters um, that... Louis had written to Joseph, his brother-in-law. Um, so she is saying that when you look at them, these letters as a whole, um, it kind of tells a different story than if you're just looking at the one side, the, the Marie Antoinette's side. Um, and so she argues that Zweig, that he was reading uh, letters from Marie Antoinette's mother, Maria Theresa, that were basically saying, my daughter's not responsible for 
these sexual problems. Her husband's a bubbling, bumbling idiot, basically. And that he didn't look at counter sources that um, explained Louis's experience of these events. Mm-hmm. And then once you do that and you look at them both together, it suggests that uh, what was actually happening was that his penis was too large to have right. sex with her. Um, and he cared about hurting her. He didn't want to hurt her, so he was trying not to. So, um, supposedly, it was known at the time, so this is according to Bertier, that Marie Antoinette had a condition known around the court as um, les toites de chemin, which is a narrow vagina. But hmm. this actually means um, a narrow chimney, I'm pretty sure. Like, literally? <laughs> yeah, like, mm-hmm. literally means a narrow. And then... Um, Louis was endowed with a bracamar assez considerable, which is a very large penis, right? Mm. So she's kind of right, considerable. <laughs> so she she's kind of uh, basically looking kind of at like more sources and pulling them all together, uh-huh. and she's saying that this is more likely. Um, and, and you know, I don't necessarily doubt it. Uh, I just, you know, I think the interesting thing is like, why does this matter? Uh-huh. I'm not saying it doesn't matter. It does. Like, but uh-huh. why? Why do we? Care, why do we care so much about? Like, right. about rehabilitating Louis, yeah. we're trying to say, oh, no, 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 he was not impotent or, like, a bumbling idiot who didn't know how to have sex. His penis was just so large that he couldn't right. have sex with his right. wife. So that you, you can see how that turns him from, like, this foppish, like, yes. loser into, yeah. like, oh, he's so manly that, like, she couldn't Her take Her tiny, it. pathetic right. vagina just couldn't handle all the man. Yeah. Right. It sort of reframes yes, that. Yes, it does. Right? Yeah. That's really important. Yeah, so it just, I, it's so interesting to me that, that that's, that that's something that, that French um, authors and historians are still, like, trying to, yeah. to talk about, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, um, yeah. Mm. in the 1980s, um, this is another interesting example of this. In the 1980s, historian Pierre Darmont uh, wrote a scathing book criticizing France's celibate clergy for engineering impotence trials in the 17th and early 18th centuries. The English edition is titled Damning the Innocent, mm. and his language is so strong that I honestly, no joke, thought it was satire. Like, I was reading it and I was like, oh, this is hilarious. <sighs> But it's an actual real history book, okay? Oh, man. So here's here's a quote from the intro. This book, therefore, relates the strange and little-known story of all those individuals who, because of a supposedly deficient sexuality, found themselves dragged before the courts and offered up as ransom to the age-old myth of virility. Their story is a pitiful drama of loneliness and silence, a timeless drama which persists in some ways to the present day. The individual accused of impotence was a defenseless victim, crushed in the wheels of indifferent legal and ecclesiastical machinery. It was only a matter of time before before he found himself condemned, openly despised, and relegated to the ghetto of the morally reprobate. Unquote. Jeez. That's <laughs> pointed. Yeah. <laughs> of the celibate clergy who committed these atrocities, Darman suggests, quote, at some level, they were perhaps acting out the same drama of inadequacy as their victims. Right. So they're prosecuting these impotence trials because they can't have sex. Right, right. It's very Freudian. It's very Freudian. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. I was actually just about to say that. (laughs) Darman goes on to analyze extensive documentation of impotence trials in pre-revolutionary France. He accuses the ecclesiastical courts of voyeurism and argues that the French Revolution emancipated impotent men from the jealous vagaries of the celibate clergy. Well, I see his point. Yeah, uh, it's and he's, an interesting he's, comparison. Yeah, and is. he's trying to kind of, like, connect the sexual lives of people to this political event. And, mm-hmm. like, that's something I'm all for. Um, I tend to think that this argument hasn't aged well. So um, it kind of casts the ancien regime, which is, like, right. before the revolution. Right. Basically. It, it casts it as dogmatic, tyrannical, and cruel. These are all stereotypes that were developed by Whiggish historians in the 19th century mm. who were, like, trying to... They heralded the French Revolution as, like, a triumph of Republican ideology. Yes. Like, just another step in becoming the perfect, uh, you know, society mm-hmm. kind of thing. Um, you know, we know now that's not actually what the French Revolution was. It's a lot more complicated than that. And it wasn't, like, a step in the right direction that solved everything. Um, And so that's kind of how he's thinking about these impotence trials, whereas 
I've already talked, we already talked about impotence trials in this episode. Mm -hmm. Um, And never was there any inclination that, like, clergy are purposely trying to hurt these men. right. Right. We've not seen any evidence of that. Right. It's a legitimate theological question that people are trying to tackle. It's not, like, a personal, like, I can't bone, so you, so you're going to be punished. Like, it's, it's just a little Mm -hmm. too much. Like, I don't know that we have evidence to say that. Right. Right. So... Still, uh, Darmon's book is very well researched and it presents a lot of anecdotes from impotence trials, um, such as instances when men were required to work up an erection in court. Um, Sometimes they were made to ejaculate in court to disprove their purported impotence. Um, You know, and and so the outrage that he has, I I get it. I mean, that's humiliating. Um, Mm -hmm. But also, it was also a different time. Um, That sounds humiliating to us. And... And I don't know that it would have been the same experience to, to someone at the time as it would right. have been to someone now. True. Others uh, who, who underwent these impotence trials, they admitted to impotence and they lived their lives as outcasts, right? Uh, at least you know, according to this historian. Yeah, right. like damned forever. And right. I think that's a little dramatic, personally. Yeah. Um, so most importantly for us, Darmon's book reinforces the idea that male impotence was an important aspect of early modern communal life, and that historical impotence has social, religious, and political implications for us, and that still matters to us today. I mean, yeah. he was so outraged in the 1980s that he was like, I need to write this book. Mm-hmm. Um, but there's also this aspect of this being a communal thing, and he's even admitting that. He's saying that... You know, the clergy are, like, looking at their local parishioners, the laity, and they're, like, you know, jealous of the people who can have sex. And right. the people who can't, they're punishing them. You know, there's this idea that there's this whole, like, communal sexuality kind mm. of. Not in the sense that people are all boning each other. Right. But then right. everybody's talking about yeah. their and sexuality. And everyone is invested in each other's sexuality. Right. right. And there's there might be some truth to that, which we'll mention in a second. Americans also play this game. Let's consider the role of impotence in the stories that Americans tell themselves about George Washington. While Louis XVI's impotence is regarded as central to the destruction of the French monarchy, Americans in some ways embrace George Washington's presumed impotence. As the first president of the New Republic, Washington's impotence is sometimes reframed as a symbolic blessing. His inability to father his own children allowed him to act as a father to the fledgling United States of America. Historian uh, Thomas A. Foster, um, and this was in Nursing Cleo, yes. I should point out. This is uh, such an awesome essay. I love it this It is. Essay. It's so good. Um, he's pointed uh, out that, yes, Washington's purported impotence was important to his biographers and to generations of historians since his death. But Foster points out that this was only so that they could issue denials of impotence. So author Marcus Cunliffe wrote in the 1950s, quote, there's nothing in his behavior Uh, to suggest that he was impotent or that his sexual nature caused him any deep uneasiness. Historian and journalist Willard Stern Randall wrote in the 1990s that Washington was, quote, mystified why year after year he and Martha could produce no Washington heir. Even physicians are getting in on this. Medical doctor and professor of medicine John K. Amory published an article in the medical journal Fertility and Sterility in 2004 that discussed Washington's inability to father a child. Amory wrote that Washington was unlikely to be impotent because he was a, quote, healthy, vigorous man. (sighs) Amory also denied the possibility that Washington could have been made infertile by a sexually transmitted disease, a problem of epidemic proportions at the time. Amory dismisses this possibility, citing Washington's character and strong sense of moral propriety. Amory also ruled out the possibility that Washington and Martha failed to conceive by chance because their sexual relations were too infrequent to guarantee conception. Quote, Inadequate sexual frequency is theoretically possible, but unlikely, because Washington's relationship with Martha was intimate, and as a farmer and expert mule breeder, he was certainly well aware of the necessary means. Oh, (laughs) sweet gravy. Okay. Sure, Dr. Amory. 
Foster smartly suggests that for Americans, an impotent founding father is problematic, but that biographers and historians have found a way to masculinize him nonetheless. And I'm going to quote Foster here. In the absence of documentation, Americans have conceded that their virile founding father may have been infertile, but that impotence is beyond the pale. Sexualized manhood has long been predicated on the ability to penetrate. On the scale of emasculating sexual deficiencies, sterility ranks slightly lower than impotence. I just want to interject really briefly um, that Washington certainly is, I think, the mo most important president who's been sort of caused this kind of panic about their ability to father children. And like, is it a is it a problem that someone who is styled as president as kind of the figurehead father of the nation, is it a problem that they are not actually a father? There was a similar debate when James Buchanan became president in the 1850s because he was unmarried and he had no children. Mm -hmm. um, and so people kind of do a similar reframing about him where they go, well, actually, it's a good thing that he doesn't have children because it means that he has more room in his heart for all of us. Right, we are like, his children. Okay, right? well then how come a father and husband can be president then? He shouldn't right. have enough room. Exactly. Right. Yeah. It's so I just think it's very interesting how there's this kind of dance around I mean obviously impotence but like the the ability to do your duty as a as a man by having children right mm -hmm. um and what that means and how people should interpret it and what what does it mean if you haven't been able to do that i just right. think that's and i think in the case of george washington it was more an issue uh you know after his death when people were thinking backwards yes. so the memory of him and then yeah. the history of him yeah it was he, more of a problem because he had a step children i think who? at least george washington yes, he did. had yes. stepchildren so like he kind of had a fatherly yeah. he, was he was a patriarch. patriarch right right Whereas so james buchanan didn't have didn't even have a relationship like he didn't even have like a wife mm -hmm. um and he didn't have any children and i should say before i i get too far afield here i just want to make sure that um you know that all of this really interesting <laughs> stuff about james buchanan comes from a really great article that appeared in the journal of the civil war era last year by a historian named Joshua Lynn called A Manly Doe Face, James Buchanan and the Sexual po Excuse me. Sectional, not sexual, politics of gender. Um, so if you're interested in more about James Buchanan's sexual politics, see, I brought it back around. Yep. Um, you should check out that article. So this leads us finally to impotence in the 19th century. And this is a topic that is close to Sarah's heart. It is. Yeah. In antebellum America, sexual impotence became a private matter. Yeah. This is entirely different from the instances of impotence that we've discussed in the ancient, medieval, and early modern contexts. So I have told this anecdote before, and I'm telling it again. I don't even care. People have heard this. I this is probably this the story. third yeah. time that's, that I've told this. But I just have to keep telling it because it's exactly perfect to illustrate this. So Eric Seaman, a professor at UB, um, he told me about a find in the archive um, that I have mentioned before. And he was studying documents from the 17th century colonial America. And he read about an encounter between a man and his neighbor as they chatted casually in a field. And the man confided in his neighbor that he'd recently struggled to maintain an erection. So in response, the neighbor said, let me see. <laughs> the man pulled out his penis and attempted to work up an erection to no avail. He and his neighbor continued to troubleshoot. They were like, all right, let's figure out what's what's going on. Right, right, right. Let's get this problem solved. <laughs> right, <man. laughs> exactly. So when, um, so remember, this is in the 17th century, so 1600s, yeah. right? When I described this encounter to my history of sexuality class and asked them what they thought, several of them said without hesitation, gay, <laughs> like immediately. They were like, okay. that's super gay. Just because he sh got he out, pulled his, out penis his penis in front of another guy. Okay. And right. They were like, and I was like, whoa, really? Why? And he's like, anybody who can get a boner in front of another guy is gay. And I was like, well, that's, first of all, not true. But right. second of all, you know. Uh, there's a lot more. Yeah, there's more to that, yeah. right? So, um, so, yeah. So this is a good anecdote um, to convey how 
differently medieval and early modern people conceived of sexual privacy. But it also reminds us that in the 17th century, impotence was not only a personal problem, but a communal problem, one that everyone took interest in as they tried to preserve the health and order of the body politic. So this is like a group effort. He's Mm -hmm. like, hey, I want my neighbor to um, have a a good, have be sexually healthy, have children, be a patriarch. This is all important to the order of society. And as we mentioned before, you were invested in the sexual potency of other people. What the sexual health of other people around you, you like wanted to know and you were kind of like invested in their ability to like be their own patriarch or to be a mother or whatever it was. Like It it wasn't a sexual interest. It was a social and political and emotional, um, communal interest. Right. Uh, in sexuality yeah. that is very strange to us because we're looking at it post-Victorians. Yeah, the Victorians. And so the way that, you know, I, I swear to God if I have to see one more time, that's not how it was back in the day. Because whenever people say back in the day, yeah. they talk about Victorian era. Yes. Or at least how the Victorians portrayed certain exactly. things. So they're right. talking about, oh, women, you know, men got boners from looking at ankles and stuff. And yeah. like... They covered up table legs and all <laughs> exactly. that. Exactly. Right. Like, that's, like... Right. I mean, there are kernels of truth in that. But yeah, it, but also, like, no. The 18th right. century was one of the most profligate centuries of, you right. know, by Victorian standards. Which is a so, good... Which is a good transition to kind of to kind of conclude by bringing it into the 19th century a little, just a tiny bit. I mean, we obviously have, we've gone crazily over time here, but yeah. um, I think it's important to say that, like, as you indicate, in the 19th century, that changes dramatically, mm-hmm. right? I mean, the sexuality is something that is considered intensely private, like between a, a man and his wife, right? Mm-hmm. This is not to say that men are not going to brothels. I mean, if you're interested in that, how that dynamic works, you should go listen to like Elizabeth's episode on sex in New York City, right? Like brothels just proliferated (laughs) in New York City. It's not like men were not um, doing kind of behaving badly in sexual ways, right? I guess I shouldn't say behaving badly, but you know what I mean? For the standards of the time considered behaving badly. Right. Um, But the particularly the issue of sexual impotence um was intensely private right like to the point where people wouldn't really feel comfortable writing about that in their diary Mm -hmm. or if they did they would use kind of coded language right right and this is a problem and i i talked to your students actually this year about sexuality during the civil war era there have been really very, very few books written about sexuality during this, the Civil War era, partly because the sources are so sparse, mm-hmm. right? Like there, We don't have lots of documents where people are talking about, like, well, I boned my wife last night. Like, you know, mm-hmm. what's his name? William Byrd is talking about in the, the 18th 1600s. century. That's like constant. Yeah. Like people write about that stuff all the time. In the 19th century, they're not. I'm not, I'm not saying they never do. But it's much, much more rare. And often we have to be able to read into what people are saying. So um, where, you know, the jumping off point for this entire episode is the fact that, you know, one chapter of my my book deals with the life story of Joshua Lawrence Chamberlain, who's a union general who's wounded very terribly in the genital region. And I argue I think convincingly, uh, that he was, you know, that his sexual function was impacted, right? I hesitate to say in exactly what way, because I just don't know. I don't have the sources. But what's really interesting is that Chamberlain and his wife, whose name was Fanny, um, are flirtatiously sexual in their letters while they're courting, right? It's flirtatious. It's not explicit. They're not saying like, can't wait to see you. I'm going to stick it in you. You know, that kind of thing. (laughs) But you can tell that they have a sexual relationship. And even during the war, he writes a couple of very kind of flirtatious letters to her. (laughs) One where he says like, it's after Gettysburg. And he's like looking out into the distance and he says, oh, in the distance, I see um, two mountains with a valley in between it. And he's like, oh, it's the valley of love. And like, 
that to a historian, like they are, they understand what he's saying. Mm -hmm. Do you know what I mean? Like that's, Mm -hmm. he's, he's talking to his wife about the fact that he misses her in a sexual sense. Mm -hmm. And then after the war, just a, just a couple years after he writes that letter to her, you know, they almost get divorced. And so by kind of piecing together the evidence that we have from their earlier relationship and piecing together the fact that they never have any more children um, and all of this wealth of medical documentation that like one pension examiner actually says his penis was non-functioning. Like it was Uh atrophied. Right. So I think that we can say (laughs) that he was not able to have a typical sexual relationship. But going back to your point about Louis the Sixteenth and George Washington and why people today are like this or this phenomenon where people today are super invested in like whether or not George Washington could have sex or Louis the Sixteenth could have sex. This is the one part of the book that I've gotten the most pushback on. That that like folks that were served as readers for the manuscript were like, I don't buy this, or. Other people kind of saying, well, if you're going to make this claim, you need to really hedge your bets. You need to be very careful about what language you use because you don't have a smoking gun letter. Mm-hmm. Um, and in the 19th century, you're not going to have that. You're mm-hmm. not going to have an impotence trial. Right. You're just not. Yeah. Right. Um, at least not in my experience. A, a historian of sexuality might say, oh, but I have an example mm-hmm. that I'm just unaware of. But Right. Um, well, I think and I think the. The key to all of this is that idea of penetrative sex. Yeah. So, like, yeah, he might have had a good sex life with her after the war. I mean, I don't think he did, but he could have, but it probably didn't involve penetrative and procreative sex. And I think that's important to point out. And I do do make that clear in the book that, like, Mm -hmm. they could have had sex in a number of ways. And that sex is still sex, right? Like, just because he was maybe unable to penetrate her or just because maybe he was unable to ejaculate that doesn't necessarily mean that they weren't having a happy healthy mm-hmm. sexual sex right. life in various other ways right but i to have him, no no i have no way him, of knowing that it's unlikely that 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 he would be satisfied with non-penetrative sex right because of all that comes along with what it means to right. be virile virile and potent and to be manly and it, like that's and it, the point. Right. And it, because of all of that, it also meant that while other veterans could go around being very openly proud of their physical sacrifices during the war, he could not do that. Right. He could mm-hmm. not make a big deal out of his wound or, like, expect people to um, see him as kind of a wounded warrior. Because if he did insist on that or try to take on that role, it would be drawing attention to the fact that this wound was so intensely private and so intensely... Right. Uh, it, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Private and... Non-visible. Well, yeah, but... Um, emasculating? Yeah. Yeah. Embarrassing, humiliating, yeah. emasculating. Yeah. But and, and that is why you get pushback on that, because he was so good at... He was very good at, at passing. Right. Yeah. At passing as non-disabled. Yeah. That... The thought that he could be impotent, just like George Washington, where, like, a urologist is like, well, he was probably not impotent. He was healthy and vigorous. Like, what the f***? Right. So, plenty of people are healthy and vigorous right. and can't get erections. Right. Like, that's not how that works. So, you and can't a, just, you that's know. That's a thing in, in the world of, of disability studies as well. Just in having to constantly prove... Um, and I have to do this with Chamberlain and many other people that show up in the book that like someone that was disabled was actually disabled when the symptoms of their disability were intermittent, right? Right. Like we want disabled people to be profoundly disabled before we'll believe that they're disabled. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. Um, so this idea that like, well, how could he possibly have been impotent if he was vigorous, right? Is very, I think, connected to those ideas of like, we want we have a vision of what it means to be impotent and it's this kind of like insane stereotypical like foppish louis the 16th Mm -hmm. right and that's incompatible with who we want george washington to have been right so and they people just can't they can't handle that so they'll go out of their way like this um, urologist right Mm -hmm. to say oh no 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 
all of these very, you know, all of these things could never have happened, right? Right. Um, based on what? Based on the fact that we know he was, I don't know, tall and strong. Right. I think that's helpful, though, to think of impotence as a disability. And, and like, a bunch of the books that I was looking at did not think of it that way. They thought of it as a problem. Mm -hmm. Um, But when you think of it as a disability, it helps a lot with gender because it it, it kind of explains, um, I think, some of the the issues with disability that you've mentioned are applicable to yeah. to impotence where yeah. when you have a non-visible disability and, impotence is not visible on a person yes. that's why george washington walked, walked down the street and people weren't like whoa what an impotent bastard like you can't right. tell right so and often impotence not always of course i mean as you mentioned sometimes it's just and you know could be psychological could just be like oh i was right had too many beers or whatever right but often impotence is connected to another disability right like con- connected to another condition medical condition or whatever mm-hmm. um and so in chamberlain's case it is explicitly tied to uh, his war wound right it's it just kind of wreaked havoc in that general vicinity right yeah um so i mean i don't know i would be fascinated to know um if disability like how impotence shows up in disability studies more broadly like in terms of contemporary kind of theory about whether impotence should be or can be considered a disability in and of itself i don't know i've not read anything on that but right no that would be i mean and that's not you don't specifically say oh all impotence is a disability right in this particular case it is yeah part and parcel with his disability exactly Yeah. yeah yeah And I was trying to to set it up so that people realized how distinctive the 19th century, this actual time period was. Because there's a lot of commonalities. Like, when we were talking about ancient Greece and Rome, I was like, whoa, this sounds just like what's happening. Very similar. Right, very similar. To to what I talked about in the masculinity episode. Exactly, exactly. But the the privacy thing is a big thing. Mm -hmm. And I think it's just important to, for people to know that, um, you know, just because impotence had cultural meaning that it had in your time period in your book that's not necessarily how it's right. always been yeah. and so you know the civil war era era is distinctive in in that sense yeah. and that's why it's so important that yeah. you wrote about it i hope so <laughs> <laughs> Well, thank you so much for listening. It was, I hope you enjoyed this episode. It was really fun uh, to record and talk about penises for this long. Um, transcripts and show notes at digpodcast.org. Uh, you can find us on Twitter at dig underscore history um, and Facebook dig underscore history. Uh, Join our Facebook group for our friends and listeners, which is called Dig History Pod Squad. Yep. Yep. And that it is fun. It's just a place to hang out and talk about history and um, and make new friends. Yep. So um, thank you for listening. We appreciate you all. We appreciate Bye. Girl. A very special thank you to Danielle, Lauren, Christopher. 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 <laughs> Ancient Mesopotamian medical authori- authorities. <laughs> Initially, though, these theological spats meant very little in the sorry i had to swallow we're going there anyway um the mesopotamian the (laughs) mesopotamian i've been boner cursed (laughs) this did not of course absolve women from any culpability for for, this did not of course absolve women for from from (laughs) leaving When the member is in no way stirred and can never perform the act of coition, this is it's a coition. Oh, okay. Okay. That's not. It should be coition because coitus. That's why. No, I, was I agree. It mm-hmm. should be, but it's just that's not how people ever say it. I will coition. Yeah. Coition. Okay. Okay. Um. Once Henry. Wait, what? That was me. I was supposed to say once Henry. No. Yeah. Oh, sorry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, you can. Sorry, sorry, sorry. Go. <laughs> it's okay. Do. It's Dig Podcast, not Dig History. Okay, I'm okay. just saying. Okay, I'm just saying. I'm just that's saying. My, that's my favorite phrase. I'm just they saying. Say it a thousand times a day. Ainsley can be like, "Go eat dog shit," and I'll be like, "What did you just say?" She's like, "I'm just saying." As if that, <laughs> as if that just like, oh, okay. well, if you're just saying. In that case, <laughs> um, in the yeah, um. Let me, I, I want to find, because there's an actual, there's like a French word that they use, and she found out what the French word means. But let me just, let me find the words first so that I can mm-hmm. 
so that I can actually give them. So Simone. So is it based on like a translation of the words that they use to describe them? Yes. Oh, that's interesting. Okay. Um, so it's not just like she's like, well, maybe she had a tiny <laughs> vagina. <laughs> no, she's not like making it up for no reason. <laughs> I think the tiny vagina thing is bullshit because you can have the tiniest vagina in the world. I mean, these they give birth to children, so I'm pretty sure right. his dick wasn't bigger than a baby. Right. So, like, I mean, she could have a condition like vulvodynia or something where, like, penetration is extremely painful. painful. Right. But, like, when has that ever stopped a monarch from, like, banging the s*** his wife, right? I don't know. Never. 